So please, as you go through this seminar, please keep in mind, if I ever use the term occult, all I'm talking about here is hidden knowledge. That's what it means. Occulted knowledge is hidden. Now, why would anybody want to hide knowledge that is extremely important? Well, there's a very specific reason, all right? But before we even get to that, we have to talk about what is this occulted knowledge? What, what is the body of knowledge? What does it comprise? When, I, when I'm saying the occult, the knowledge of the occult, what do I mean by that? All right? Occult knowledge constitutes two things. There's two general bodies of occult knowledge. In, in, in the actual mystery traditions and in occult schools, they talk about these as arcana. A-R-C-A-N-A. -A, arcana. Ar the word arcana is also Latin. It means knowledge. Okay? That's all it means. So there's two bodies of knowledge. There's one body of knowledge in the occult called lesser arcana. The lesser arcana or the minor arcana. This means the, the knowledge of the microcosm. The knowledge of the small things. Okay? It doesn't mean it's less important. It means it's dealing with the individual units of consciousness, the human psyche, the, the psyche of the individual, okay? So the first part, the first major body of occult knowledge constitutes knowledge of human consciousness, how it works, how it operates, what our motivations are, things like that, okay? The second body of occult knowledge is called the greater arcana or the major arcana. All right. And again, this doesn't refer to that it's more important. It refers to it is the macrocosmic understanding, the understanding of the very large laws of nature that govern the, the, the macrocosm. OK, so universal laws are part of the greater arcana of occult knowledge. And what I call here today under the umbrella, the term natural law, falls into that second category of greater knowledge, the greater arcana of occult knowledge, okay? And what these natural laws are, are unseen and universal spiritual laws. We're going to talk, we could talk about the word natural here too. Natural is derived from Egyptian and other Middle Eastern tradition languages, okay? The word netter in, in Egyptian, which would have been spelled without vowels. If we transliterated it, it would be N-T-R in English. Netter means spirit in Egyptian, in ancient Egyptian. The, the, the suffix A-L, even in English today, but if you go back into Arabic languages and, uh, you know, ancient Middle Eastern languages, um, A-L as a suffix actually means of or related to, or having come from, okay? So natural, if you put these root words together, netter and al, right, it means of or related to the realm of spirit, of or related to God, actually. The word netter also meant God, spirit or God, okay? So this is the spiritual domain, the laws that actually are operating in the unseen realm, okay? Now, they manifest in the physical realm. We're going to talk about that. Okay, because that's the, the operation that it trickles down from. It starts in the spiritual domain and then it manifests in the physical domain. All right? So it's important to understand these two bodies of knowledge, the lesser arcana, okay, is about the monad or the individuated unit of consciousness of the human being. And then the greater knowledge is about the laws that govern the macrocosmic universe. All right. So, what these laws do, this body of of uh, the workings of nature that I am calling under the umbrella natural law, they're universal spiritual laws which govern the consequences of behavior. They govern the consequences of behavior, and I would add a caveat to that: they govern the consequences of behavior for intelligent species, for beings that are capable of coming to their understanding, okay? I, I, and I would delineate that from, like, the animal kingdom, okay? The animal kingdom is not held to the same standard 
as the as human beings when it comes to this body of information because I don't think you're going to sit down with your cat and explain natural law to it okay so when people say well why doesn't the animal kingdom uh, held to account in the same way the human beings are it's because surprise surprise we don't share the same level of consciousness okay there is differences in levels of consciousness and abilities to comprehend information and, and uh, to actually know how something works. Just like you will not be explaining physics to your dog anytime soon, okay? You're not going to explain natural law to the animal kingdom and have them grasp it because they're not at the same level of consciousness as, as we are, okay? So we are held to a different account when it comes to natural law. It governs human behavior. It would be an easy way of saying it. Th this body of knowledge has actually been called consequentialism by past researchers and teachers. And I have no problem with that term. I, I, I've actually looked into consequentialism and it's quite similar, okay, in, in its scope and what it teaches. It's been called karma, karmic law in many Middle Eastern and Eastern traditions, okay? And I have no problem with that term for it either. It has been called in some of the Western traditions and Christian traditions moral law. And I have no problem with that term either. Uh, religionists have called it God's law, and I have no problem with that term either. I have no problem with any of these terms being applied to the umbrella of natural law, because th that is essentially what it is. But we're going to get into deeply into how it works and operates in our lives here today. Why is this knowledge hidden away from people? To what ends? The knowledge of the occult, the hidden in knowledge about how natural law works and how consciousness works, is not commonly known. That's why it's not the exoteric. It's not given to the masses. It's the esoteric. It is reserved for the few. And there's a reason for that. It's been deliberately hidden away and kept from the general public in order to create and maintain a power differential. Because if someone else is an extreme level of knowledge, and they know how something works, like something as trivial as how human consciousness works, how human motivations work, how human perceptions work, how human beings can be manipulated. If somebody has deep knowledge of that information, and there's a whole bunch of people over here who have not one iota of how that works. What kind of a number do you think somebody can do on people like that? See, the way I ask people to look at this is real simple. Imagine a very, very, very advanced psychologist at the top of his field, wrote all the textbooks, okay? And he's got a house out in the burbs. He comes into the university. To t he's got tenure, okay? He's got the trophy wife, the house out in the suburbs, the three-car garage, driving the Lexus into work at his tenure job. And he finds out that his trophy wife is having an affair because she's bored. She's not satisfied with him at home. And it's maybe the 19-year-old, uh, uh, you know, uh, captain of the local uh, high school football team or something. He's a senior. He's a star football player, right? The jock, yeah. And she has a fling with him. Well, what if he decides I'm going to become buddy-buddy with my boy here after finding out about his wife's affair. And this kid, this punk, who's cheating on, my, you know, my wife's cheating on me with, uh, he knows nothing. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't study the mind. He doesn't know anything even about himself. He watches TV six hours a day, plays violent video games, is obsessed with football, you know? What kind of a number you think that psychologist can do on that kid? Total number. That's the answer, exactly. That's right. He could do a total number on him. He can gain his confidence. He can get into his head. And I guarantee you, you give him a little bit of time, he could screw up his life based on what he knows and how he would be able to manipulate based on his hatred of that person. Well, guess what? That's the position humanity's in. We're that punk jock. And I'm not saying we necessarily did something to deserve it, but we're in that same position where the people with this knowledge at the highest levels, they hate us. And they're doing a total number on us. 
because we don't have this knowledge. And until that changes, don't expect the playing field to be leveled. Expect it to get worse. Okay? The knowledge is hidden to create and maintain a power differential between those who hold it and those who are ignorant of it. It's that simple. The knowledge of natural law and its operations constitutes what I call the most deeply occulted or hidden information that exists on this planet. You will not find any more hidden information. This is the thing that all the distractions are there for, to keep you from learning. The endless trivialities, the nonsense you hear on the news, all the video games, all of the nonsense television, the sports, you know, it's all there to keep people from understanding this. And I can't get you to accept that or believe it, and I don't ask you to believe it. I'm telling you that's what they're trying to, from my years of being inside occult traditions that are very, very dark, I'm telling you this is what they don't want you to know from firsthand experience. How many people here today, today know that I was involved in the dark occult in my past? Good. Great. Okay. The powers that be want to seek to keep this information hidden from the people of the earth at all costs because understanding this information about natural law will level the playing field and put an end to the currently entrenched systems of control that are operating on the earth. We should very clearly make a distinguishment between nescience and ignorance so the people fully understand the difference between these two concepts. How many people even have heard the term nescience? Very few. Th this is a word that has practically been sanitized from colloquial English. Practically been sanitized from the English lang language. And there's a reason for that too. There's two contexts to not knowing something. The first context is nescience. Okay? Nescience comes from the Latin the prefix ne in Latin means not or not present or absent, okay? And then scio, sciere in Latin means to know. It's where we get the word science from, okay? So you put them together and nescience, it, it actually, those two roots form another word, nescire. Nescire in Latin means not to know, to not know, to not understand. But there's a connotation to it. It means to not understand because the specific information that you may be uh, having uh, a desire to understand is completely absent. It is not present and you cannot actually aggregate that information. You can't bring those pieces of grammar together to form the sentence, okay? It's not present, okay? So you don't have it at all. It's unattainable. This should be clearly delineated from ignorance. 